Welcome. Before we begin, please be aware that our discussions on mental health issues may include sensitive topics and situations that could be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised, and if you find these subjects distressing, we encourage you to seek support or skip episodes that may be uncomfortable for you. Your well-being is important to us. Welcome to Healing Echoes, Rebuilding Life After Trauma and Abuse. Today we have with us Shannon Spring. Shannon graduated from Boston College with a Bachelor's in Human Development and Communications, a Master's in Education from the Citadel and the National Speakers Academy, and holds numerous certifications as a creativity coach. Shannon's a certified animal communicator and professional psychic medium with worldwide clients of all species. She's the author of the soon to be published memoir, Open Mic for Animals, Evidential Fairy Tales. Shannon's presented to audiences of five to 5,000, including Fortune 500 companies, hospitals, colleges, law firms, banks, and civic groups. As a psychic medium and educator of 25 years, Shannon knows how to read a room, create memorable events filled with laughter, creative inspiration, practical game of life survival strategies, and an intangible magical feeling in the air. Hello, Shannon. Hey, Caitlin. Thanks for having me. Of course. We appreciate you being here. So I want to jump right in. I know that you um, use humor in a lot of your professional and personal life um, and that humor can be a really powerful coping mechanism. So could you share uh, how you first discovered the healing potential of humor um, in dealing with trauma and such? Yeah, um, I'd say really just, you know, the first thing is just discovering humor at all. Um, (laughs) You know, not just uh, applying it for trauma, but just understanding humor and how it works. And, you know, all of us as kids, we get that first thrill when we make somebody laugh. We learn how to tell a joke. Uh, We watch what makes the people around us laugh and, of course, get a kick out of making our friends laugh at school. Mm -hmm. And that was I was always the class clown, really loved making people laugh. I went to a very strict uh, Catholic school Mm -hmm. and humor wasn't really encouraged. You know, there weren't any uh, extracurricular stand up comedy classes (laughs) (laughs) um, in Catholic school. So when I learned the power of humor of making my friends laugh, I think that was really powerful. And then. Um, I grew up in a very abusive family. So mm-hmm. my my father was uh, cruel and a bully. Uh, mm-hmm. His humor, and I'm putting that in quotes, mm-hmm. which was, was mean and degrading and the exact opposite of humor. Of course, there are some people who do that type of humor professionally. Right. And they get their own fan base. That is not my style. Um, but whenever I would use humor, it was like a connection with him. Um to really get him to be kinder to me, you know, make him laugh. He's in a better mood. Right. Um, yeah. So it's humor is definitely, it adds to our quality of life and it's also a survival skill. And I've learned how to use humor in all kinds of situations since I was a kid to help improve a situation and certainly to make my day go better too. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to say it almost became um, like a survival uh, technique. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, humor has multiple purposes. So it's not a one-dimensional activity or or skill set. And right. I think it's something that I really thoroughly enjoy teaching positive humor to children. For many years, I've taught comedy improv to kids mm-hmm. and creative writing, creative storytelling, all those things, and helping kids understand how funny they are and how humor can be used to communicate positively and how great it feels to make ourselves laugh uh, and then make everybody else laugh. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I laugh at my own jokes, I'm it's a good enough day for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. At least, yeah. you know, you always have somebody uh, making you laugh. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And when I was, you know, I just finished my first book. It's due out in February, March uh, 2024. Mm-hmm. And the whole book is about how I... Uh, became an animal communicator and use humor with the animals and have used humor to survive very serious situations. And it was a great 
uh, incredible healing transformative process to write the book. Mm -hmm. I believe it's going to do a lot of good. And what was cool about it is, you know, it, it took me about a year to write the book and I'd read some things I hadn't written in months and go, oh, wow, that's really funny. I forgot I wrote that. And then I'd read other things and go, oh, no, I see why I was trying to be funny there, but it didn't turn out to be funny. Mm -hmm. So let me rewrite it. Let me rework it. Humor is it's a great tool for telling the truth. Um, starting with ourselves, if we can have a good sense of humor about ourselves, we are way ahead of the game. The least fun people to be around are people who don't tell the truth and people who don't have a sense of humor about themselves. Yeah, it's it, really incredible. I know people like that, and they're very easily threatened by people who are very comfortable in their own skin, like yeah. myself. Yeah. And, <laughs> can't be playful with them they take themselves too seriously they don't think they make any mistakes yeah so you know people go around like as perfectionists often can't see the humor in their foibles and that is no fun to be around mm -hmm. um, it, they put a lot of pressure on themselves and then put that pressure on their kids or their animals mm -hmm. i live with four dogs and animals are tremendous comedy buddies and humor <laughs> ambassadors you know with getting us to play and yeah. then us to need to laugh something off. You know, this morning I woke up and I'm like, why does it smell like throw up in here? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to find the source of that, you know, and as long as nobody's sick, you know, you can pretty much laugh off something that's happening and really, really put things into perspective and understand what our priorities are. And one of my number one priorities, especially with the older I get now, is just have more fun and lighten up. Yeah, it brings um, a whole new quality to life for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, many people find it uh, challenging to use humor, um, especially in the darkest moments. And I know we've touched on how it can help you or has helped you, especially in those really dark times. Um, but could you describe some specific instances or techniques you do, you've used to find humor in difficult situations um, and how they impacted your mental health besides the one that you have mentioned? Yeah, um, I actually do a whole keynote presentation on this, on um, how to use humor in trauma and recovery and in getting sober. Oh. So I'll give uh, the example of using humor and getting sober <laughs> the sobriety movement is not really known for being fun and games and a, and a laugh a minute <laughs> it's <No. laughs> um, you know very very heavy and very serious understandably however i think there is a tremendous need to add balance in recovery um the whole healing you know movement for lack of a better word can just get enough already with people just telling their sad stories over and over and over again and it can work against us if we're just telling the stories but we're not um taking action to add in the positive on top of the negative you know one of the best ways to drown out bad painful memories is to start crowding them out with good positive memories there's a time and a place to discuss our trauma and to heal our trauma. But if that's all we're doing, we're going to stay stuck and get worse. So um, I realized I needed to get sober and quit drinking. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Words are very, very powerful. The way that mm -hmm. we speak about ourselves, the things that we uh, label things in society a lot. You know, think of the term adult beverages, mm -hmm. right? Oh, there'll be some adult beverages there. There'll be some adult beverages. I'll tell you what, man. One of the things I realized that I started becoming, I don't know, for lack of a better word, jealous of kids over is that you go to a kid's party and the kids are just having fun. Yeah. And they're just playing and they're being, here's a big word. They're being themselves, <laughs> which adults forget how to do. And mm -hmm. then they need a crutch, you know, they need their coffee. They need their alcohol. They need their smoking or vaping or, oh my God, you know, Something. Uh, it's really depressing, honestly, mm -hmm. and not as much fun to be around. So when I just started to remember, like, what were the things that I enjoyed doing as a kid? All right, you know, break it down. I liked playing with dolls. Can I play with dolls as an adult? 
you know what? I can. Um, and actually a friend of mine and I are getting ready to revive my children's puppet shows. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, oh my God. They're so much fun again. Cause you, you know, we'll break it down step-by-step. Step. I can write a funny puppet script. So mm -hmm. that's a comedic activity right there where I can take a problem um, such as, well, if I'm going to do an adult puppet show, I can do it on sobriety, doing a children's puppet show, how to make friends. And you can take a painful situation of maybe not having any friends or getting bullied and have the character learn to show confidence through having humor about him or herself, mm -hmm. which is a wildly healing mechanism to overcome bullying when people are trying to one down us so they can feel better about ourselves is use humor in return. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always desired to use humor. It's not always appropriate, but that's up for us to decide, you know, how we want to handle the, our feelings or how somebody's treating us. Right. Um, and so watching how the things that I used to like to do as a kid, I started to remember, okay, I liked to play. I liked to be outside. I loved being around animals. I loved performing. And then adult me needed to have a consult with younger me and kind of, you know, kick the therapist to the curb and say, okay, younger Shannon, what made you happy? And how can we help older Shannon feel happy? And that's when I started getting back to play and creating a whole business on play, which I'll get to in a moment, but mm -hmm. sticking with the theme of sobriety, um, we use the term partying, you know, in our twenties and thirties, oh, let, you know, we're going out and we're partying, we're partying, we're partying. Well, mm -hmm. at what time, you know, at what point does it turn and switch from partying to just being a drunk, yeah. you know, and you're not partying when you're not actually even remembering the party anymore. Yeah. Or the next day you wake up and you feel lousy emotionally or physically. Um, so redefine that term, redefine what an adult beverage for me, an adult beverage is water. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and, and it's so interesting and dichotomous when we think an adult is supposed to be responsible, mm -hmm. right? And then we throw the word adult in front of beverages and that's the opposite of responsible here's an alcoholic drink that's going to impair your judgment and we're going to label that adult yeah and how much society pushes that it's so weird to be sober I know when I went through my sobriety it was always expected for me to partake in those adult beverages <laughs> uh, oh yeah I went to an event the other night um, a theater in Tampa and they advertised your ticket comes with four drinks I was horrified by that, by how irresponsible that is. You know, the people, you got people drinking and driving, you, yeah. got, you know, you don't need four drinks. This no, is four is enough to do some damage. It is. And, you know, I, I am preaching to the choir because I believe in practicing what I preach. I was drinking like a double bottle of Pinot Grigio for a day for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's like eight glasses of wine and bad habit it was increasing depression increasing anxiety increasing mm -hmm. ptsd it's literally doing the exact opposite of what we wanted to do i think one of the trickiest parts is when you talk about sobriety to people it can be very threatening because being an adult sucks a lot of the times you know we are the ones as opposed to kids that in general are going to need more strategies to manage our stress because our stress continues to multiply. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we have more health concerns. We have more pressures on us, more responsibilities, all these things. So Absolutely. humor is a positive, easy, fun, healthy way to recover from whatever stressing us out. So I took the responsibility to kick adult beverages to the curb and I got myself to one and only AA meeting. And I went into the AA meeting and I happened to choose like, there's so many AA meetings out there. Um, and I chose like the scariest one. And the moment I walked in the room, I was like, oh God, um, because people looked rough. <laughs> right. Really rough. I still looked okay. You know, like I still <laughs> looked healthy despite being you know in really bad shape and you have to go around the room and of course you know the two biggest rules are obviously don't drink and then you have to you know give their and I'm just going to speak freely here as I always do mm -hmm. it, to me it's a bit of a cult and everybody has to say I'm so and so and I'm an alcoholic and if you don't say that you're breaking the rules and if you don't say it now you're the biggest alky in the room you know right 
Um, I don't agree with that. I think if you're going to recover for something, or I'll speak for myself, if I'm going to recover from something and make a positive change in my life, I'm not going to identify myself with the very freaking thing that I want to, you know, get rid of, change, right. transform. That's ridiculous. You're never going to hear me say, I am depression. I am PTSD. So yeah, you why have I, the thing. You don't have to yeah, Why would I thing? say I am an alcoholic? It's like for some people it works. And so for them, you know, hooray, that's awesome. For me, I had to come up with my own strategies. And that's all any of us can ever really do is speak for ourselves and what works for us. And when I'm giving talks and keynotes, it's here's my story. Here's things that I have done. You take from it what will help you leave the rest alone. But don't attack the way that I'm doing it or don't criticize me for what I'm doing it or attack and criticize, but just know it's not going to matter to me. Right. Because I am, you know, happily and very successfully sober for around 13 years. Congratulations. And, well, thanks. There's a, you know, most people know like the exact date or the exact year. Mine's a little more complicated. <laughs> um, I feel it. Yeah. Which, you know, my stories always have stories within stories within stories. <laughs> and it's like, I wish I could answer that question in one word, but I can't. And that's not to be a politician because I will actually always tell the truth. But it's just sometimes there's a little bit more uh, details to give. So we're going around the room and I happen to be reading this book at the time that was called I Am and how important it is af after the phrase I am that we identify I am abundant. I am beautiful. I am love. And now I'm in a room full of people where I'm supposed to say I am an alcoholic. So I went, OK, Shannon. And I love to challenge myself, Caitlin, on, again, practice what I preach. Who am I? We are constantly answering the question, who am I, by the way we treat people, by how we think about ourselves and our actions, you mm -hmm. know? Um, <laughs> so I wanted to be fair, play by their rules, but not dishonor myself. So everybody, I'm Bob, I'm an alcoholic, I'm Susan, I'm an alcoholic. And then it got to me and I said, and you can't see my gestures, which is like part of the humor on this, but everybody's staring at me. And I said, hi, my name is Shannon. And I had a hard time admitting I'm an alcoholic. Until I realized I'm also a drug addict <laughs> and everybody laughed like the whole room laughed because it was so unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was kind of nodding their head like, oh, there she is. She's following the rules. Yep. 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 Shannon's an alcoholic. And then I'm like, but I'm also a drug addict. Yeah. And for me personally, being an alcoholic was small potatoes compared to being a drug addict. Um, and it's, you know, not that it's a competition, but in terms of the two things that it was harder to recover from, um, prescription drugs were millions of days, years, heartaches harder than alcohol, mm -hmm. even though I had been drinking for many, many more years. Um, you know, I started drinking in high school, like a lot of people I know, um, not, you know, not drinking on a daily basis, not out, but, you know, experimented with alcohol in high school. Um, then in college was drinking a lot. Uh, and then, you know, partying, socializing, networking, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. It just, it's so ingrained in us. Yeah, that it really is. I, I couldn't even think about attending a party without alcohol. It, it's just, and now when I see people like that, I genuinely, you know, I have compassion for them, but I also, and I hate to use this word, I pity them mm -hmm. because it's a tough way to go through life, always having to drink. Yeah. And I was at an event the other night, man, it was just a networking event. And there were some people just pounding it down. And it's like, why? Yeah. Number one, just because it's there doesn't mean you have to drink it. And number two, like, what are you trying to escape? And I believe in creating and living a life that I don't have to escape from. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody the other night asked me a great question. And she said, well, how do you take the edge off? And I said, well, I don't you know, I've become a lot happier. Right. So I had to go to the source of the problem, which is, oh my God, I was deeply unhappy. And we come back to the point of truth telling. Can you tell the truth to yourself? One of the most terrifying questions for people to answer, Caitlin, is the question, am I happy? Yeah, they're scared Absolutely. of that answer. Absolutely scared because people are, you know, Hey, how you doing? Oh, great. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. It's just, again, societally appropriately to tell everybody that you're good. You're great. Mm -hmm. you're fine. Never better. Especially with the social media nonsense Yeah, uh, with everybody's BS. So anyway, um, the, you know, really it was 
quite cruel in that when I went to get help for depression, anxiety, and PTSD, I then got medications that made me addicted. I didn't yeah. see, I, I wasn't actually seeking to get high. You know, yeah. I wasn't buying cocaine. I wasn't out um, buying anything to get high. I was trying to literally heal the trauma, feel better. Um, and I have lots and lots of opinions on that stuff, but mm-hmm. prescription drugs, man, that is yeah. a, you are changing your brain chemistry, humor. You, we can change our brain chemistry through humor, through exercise, through positive relationships, through creativity, through writing, through reading, through watching comedies, mm-hmm. humor in and of itself you know, I have this character that I play in my business, uh, just humor me. And I play this character, Dr. McHumor me. And I have a humor stand that's on wheels, like Lucy from the peanuts. Mm-hmm. And, um, it says, uh, got problems, donate them to charity. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> and, uh, I like, I have a fee structure. It's like, you know, 10 bucks for good advice, uh, five bucks for so-so advice and a dollar for highly risky advice. <laughs> and, uh, people come up to me with their problems and I solve them for a donation with humor, with fun. So I started this out like in Raleigh. I was at a street festival many years ago and I set up my humor stand as Dr. McHumor me. People came up with problems. Some of them were silly problems. Um, some of them were just typical problems. You know, oh, I, I hate driving. I get so stressed in traffic. So I'd give them some fun things to do in the car to reduce stress. But then I had a couple of people come up with very serious problems. I had a young woman came up to me who said, I'm gay and I don't know how to tell everybody. Mm. So how am I going to use humor to respond to that? In that answer, or excuse me, in that immediate instance, it would be highly inappropriate for me to begin with humor Mm. um, because that could hurt her feelings. It could scare her away. It could be misconstrued as I don't take her feelings seriously. Right. You know, then I begin acknowledging with compassion. Sometimes you can meet the person with something that you've struggled with as seriously without then making the situation or the story about you. Yeah, just relating. Just relating. And then oftentimes there will be a moment to use humor. Um, Sometimes I have many, many resources and games and activities that I do, Caitlin, to help me find the humorous perspective in a situation Mm -hmm. and other people. This is why I lead humor retreats and and teach people, okay, let's take something about, um, you know, your sexuality or let's take addiction, which those things aren't funny, but mm-hmm. we can find humor in them. And the moment that I made that joke in the AA meeting, the second I made myself laugh, I sent the message to my brain, my heart, my soul, we're going to be fine. We're going to mm-hmm. be fine. And I sent the message to the other people in the room too. Like you can also laugh and you can also be happy and joyful and find moments of reprieve. It's the same thing with grief. You know, I'm also a medium and an animal communicator. So I deal with people that are losing animals or human loved ones. Mm -hmm. Nothing funny about that. No, not at all. There are lots of moments of humor that come up when in grief, including the signs that our loved ones send us when they're trying to get our attention. I get to deliver so much humor and I will say comedy um, in grief sessions that come up. You know, even yesterday I was doing a reading for somebody and we were, um, she became very emotional, started crying and she said, oh, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I want to talk to my dog, you know, fluffy in heaven mm-hmm. and um, we, just see if he's around with me. Now, as soon as I start tuning into this dog's energy, a squirrel leaps, I'm looking out my living room window now, a squirrel leaps from the big tree down into this tiny little delicate tree out of nowhere and is having the time of his life swinging on this little tree. <laughs> and looks at me kind of just smiling. And I said, your dog was a squirrel chaser, wasn't he? And she said, oh, he loved squirrels. He loves squirrels. He spent hours watching the squirrels. So it was literally like a flying sign of common, you know, comedic relief came in mm-hmm. um, during a grief reading. And she went from crying to, ah, oh, you know, her face lit up, it became pink again, smiling. And Aww. yeah, so there's always um, comedic relief moments at hand we need to give ourselves what i call permission to play mm-hmm. adults man are really good at being their own party poopers <laughs> you know? and finding ways to sabotage their own joy to, t- to try to take the joy away from others right 
Um, and that's something that really pisses me off, man. Like joy thieves, people that are going around trying to wipe, wipe the smiles off other people's faces. Yeah. Uh, happened to me the other night on a networking event and I confronted the person and I just right out of my mouth said, why were you just so unkind to me? Mm. And, you know, expected an answer. Yeah. I'm not going to go up to her and go, oh, <laughs> you know, that was kind of, I'm not going to downplay what she did. What she did was really serious, really mean, really cruel and really immature. All right. Uh, and I don't put up with bullying of myself or of others. There's lots of ways we can handle it. Um, I took a comedy improv class up in St. Pete the other day. Mm -hmm. And inherently that's going to be fun. You're there to play fun and games. Right. So we're in the middle of playing the games. All these, I love, love, love comedy improv, man, is a wonderful tool in recovery from depression, from anxiety, drugs, and alcohol. It forces us in a positive way to be in the moment mm -hmm. get out of our heads get into our hearts and get into play again the more that we can become childlike not childish mm -hmm. the happier our hearts are going to be um the healthier we're going to be so we're playing these games and um to set up a, a couple of the times when it came to me to be like the final person to close out the improv story i it had like a sexual in innuendo the job you know the way to wrap up the story or the game something like that it's a group of adults you know mm -hmm. people in there in their 50s and 60s and even a couple in their 70s so right it's of, of age by many <laughs> years and I was like the second time I said something the whole class laughs but this one woman once again man says oh sounds like somebody's not getting enough <laughs> To which without missing a beat. So she's trying to use humor, but it's not humor. It's actually cruelty. And you she's know? trying to insult. She's trying to reduce me. Oh, you're having so much fun. Oh, you're getting a laugh from everybody. Well, I don't like the attention you're getting. Let's get the attention on me and I'm going to cut you down. Mm -hmm. So to my credit, I was like, no, nope, not on my watch. And so she makes her comment, you know, oh, somebody's not getting enough. And I looked right at her without missing a beat. And I said, or I'm getting so much, it's just pouring out of me. <laughs> and then that got an even bigger laugh. So what I have responded with is not mean and it's not cutting her down, but it does build me up with, you're not, I'm not going to play this game with you. Yeah. You know, all of us show our character through how we treat other people and how we treat ourselves. I'm and if sure we're treating, our, uh, if we're treating ourselves poorly, we really are inviting other people to do the same. Yeah. I've noticed it. You know, I noticed the other day uh, somebody was trying to break one of my rules as a client. And I noticed myself, I have a rule that it can only be the client present for the session. It's mm -hmm. a really important rule. That means you can't have your husband show up. You can't say, oh, my son's here. Oh, my daughter's here. Oh, my neighbor's right. here. Just you. It's just you. That's it. This is a private reading unless it's pre-approved by me. There are a lot of reasons for that for my client's protection so that, you know, maybe there's somebody in the house that's controlling or abusive or narcissistic. Many of the animals have told me about domestic violence situations. Oof. It's also for my own focus. I'm doing a reading for one person, not your entire family. Right. Um, so again, it has to be pre-approved. So she put me in an awkward situation because she was in severe grief. So I'm naturally very compassionate and that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And then she drops a person on me. Oh, by the way, my, you know, I'm just going to say family member is here. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, ah, ah. So I find myself over apologizing to her, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. All I needed to do was say, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, but this is just a reading for one person. He's more than welcome to book a session on his own, or you're more than welcome to book a session in the future for the two of you. But for day, for today, it's just going to be you and I. Yeah. Instead, I find myself being a little apologetic, a little people pleasing. I'm not that <laughs> people pleasing person, but I do try to be very cooperative. I try to be very flexible. So we're all constantly walking these fine lines between being agreeable people, having boundaries, you know, above yeah. all respect to ourselves. So anyway, so I'm, I'm always trying to be aware of where can I use humor appropriately? Where can I use humor to reduce stress? And then sometimes where can I just avoid pain and stress and prevent it by standing my ground firmly and unapologetically, mm -hmm. you know? 
um, none of it's about being a jerk, but yeah. humor, yeah, humor definitely is not about cutting people down, reducing them. I see it happen when it happens in any of my kids' classes, which is, and by kids' classes, I mean when I'm the teacher. Right. Um, it rarely happens because I set the tone for that as the teacher. The very few times that that has happened, ooh, you know, that kid learns real fast. <laughs> Yeah, we don't use humor to oh, guys being mean. <laughs> that, that's not going to happen, you know? And I will, in that moment, teach the child a very valuable lesson without putting him or her down, but by holding up a mirror and saying, did that feel good to say that that way? Mm. You know, do you feel proud of hurting somebody else's feelings? Um, and they need to learn that very early on that our words and our actions have consequences on other people. And as adults, we need to hold ourselves accountable. Number one, if we're going to hold children accountable, we darn well better be doing the right thing on ourselves. Yeah, true. Yeah. I, um, I absolutely love this. I, the two questions that I had had were, you know, how to, how do you balance it in delicate situations? You answered that. Um, and then I had another question about um, uh, like implementing it into your, you know, your professional life and how you deal with like the sensitive topics again. And you you answered that too. So it's perfect. I just, I absolutely love that you like covered everything um, that was on my mind without me even having to ask. <laughs> That's this, a little bit of psychic me and a little it's bit. It's perfect. So I just want to thank you, Shannon, for coming on today and um, taking time out of your day to share everything with us. And uh, just wanted to ask if you had any last tips or advice to give us. Sure. Um, I would definitely say that no matter what you're going through, remember that there's an expression that says the sun is always shining behind the clouds so that even on the cloudiest days emotionally there technically still is an inner sunshine within us even when we can't see it hear it or feel it it still exists and it's still a possibility to tap into it so when you're going through something difficult and even as a preventative measure make sure you're finding ways to add lightness to add humor and positivity, whatever that takes. I actually give a keynote talk called The Three Secrets to Being Fun Inspired. And those were some hard-earned tips mm -hmm. on how to use humor in every which way. All of us have daily stresses and then the big life events. And the more that we use humor on a daily basis, the more resilience we're going to have, the more of a full tank we're going to have to pull from when the big stuff hits. And I would say as much as possible, um, cut out the toxic people from your life. Sometimes we can't, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. we're forced um, into a situation where we have to work for somebody difficult or we live next to a toxic neighbor or we're in a toxic relationship. But stand your ground in terms of having the right to enjoy your life. You know, it's literally right there in the Constitution, the right to pursue life, <laughs> liberty and, and happiness. So demand that for yourself and create it in small doses and you'll be able to build it up to supersized doses. So again, I do whole weekend retreats on this and then even um, laughy hours and laughing lunches. So one hour humor breaks during the weekday. All of that's on my website, justhumorme.com. And you can find me on the social media channels at Just Humor Me Friends. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today on Healing Echoes. We hope you, our listeners, found today's episode as enlightening and thought-provoking as we did. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing leaving a review, or sharing it with someone who might benefit from these discussions. We'll be back with more engaging conversations and insightful content soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, take care and remember that your journey matters.